So let's start. Thank you very much for coming this Friday. Um, today, I will give a nice my talk. So our speaker, Kinsley, uh, she is with the database curator for one place. She actually is heavily involved in the gene oncology development. So it's one of the, I can, one of the successfully developed and applied oncology uh, in real world application. Um, so uh, she, um, she's currently work uh, for WombBase. It is the online database housing the genetic, genomics, and biology of what uh, I uh, You can say C elegance. Yep. And, and other, other, other important things. She served as an oncology editor and the co manager of the annotation of working groups for the G Oncology Consortium and is a member of editorial board for um, the Journal of Biological Database and Curation. She holds a BA from Biochemistry from the University of Rochester and PhD from um, PhD in Molecular, uh, cell Cellular and Development of Biology from the University of Colorado. So now let's welcome mm -hmm. our speaker to give a talk about team on huh? Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. This is actually my first visit to Bloomington, and so it's been really lovely. I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, so everybody can hear me okay. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to you uh, about today is uh, mostly about the field of biocuration uh, that I came to um, from being a bench scientist uh, in C. elegans. Um, through uh, a company uh, that existed for a while called Proteome, and then to WormBase and the Gene Ontology Consortium. And so I've been at WormBase now for about 14 and a half years, and so things have changed a lot from when I started. And so I want to give everyone today a sense of the kind of things that we do there uh, and some of the challenges that uh, we face in the biocuration field. So, um, as you, many of you uh, certainly appreciate, biology is really the study of living systems. And what we want to help people understand are what are the pieces that make up the puzzle of this living system and how do they function with each other to accomplish a particular biological objective. So early research in biology, when I was a graduate student, um, which was in the 90s, it was mostly limited to interrogating the role of a subset, and I'll say a relatively small subset, um, of entities in any given system. So as a graduate student, you might be working on studying and cloning your gene, um, and maybe uh, if you were working on a particular pathway, you might be looking at tens of genes, but that was more typical of what people did. But then with the advent of whole genome sequencing that started to come through in the mid to late 90s, the kinds of experiments that people could do and the kind of questions that could be asked really changed and the scale of that became much, much larger. Um, so now uh, we sort of think that in part we're living in this biology in the era of omics. So um, there's transcript. Uh, genomics, the DNA sequence, the transcriptomics, where people um, are looking, surveying the expression of um, RNAs, um, both messenger, non-coding RNAs. Proteomics, where people are sampling um, the levels and types of proteins expressed in a system. And metabolomics as well. People are starting to look a lot more at uh, the composition and the functions of metabolites in different systems. And we can really ask biological questions on a much larger scale. So this was um, from a recent paper that came out where authors were really interested in understanding, you know, what is the difference in gene expression across uh, different tissues, liver versus stem cells, for example? How does that change as animals age? And how does that relate to things like uh, the circadian um, rhythm? as well as respond to environmental changes, such as, say, for example, caloric restriction. And so you can see that uh, the level at which um, people are uh, generating data and the number of genes that come from experiments like this has really vastly increased. So how do we make sense of the massive amount of data that gets produced by these omics experiments? And this is really 
uh, the work that, that I do now. And so, in part, this is a classification problem, right? So when you get a list of 2,000 or more genes to look at from your experiment, you know, what are these entities? What are their real functions or role in a biological system? And do we have sufficient language to describe what that role is? And so it was recognized um, probably, you know, 20 years ago or so at least, that the scale of this problem in biology really required a computationally amenable classification system. And so the solution then to that was uh, to develop ontologies. So uh, a lot of people in this room probably know uh, about ontologies, um, but uh, just to recap, these are really formal, bioontologies are really formal representations of biological knowledge. So just a key, few of the key features of ontologies. Ontologies, uh, we want to determine um, or model what are uh, specific types or classes. Uh, these are categories into which real bio, um, biological events or entities fall. Um, in ontologies, there are relationships between these types. So one of the relations uh, is, an, is a relation, I'll talk a little bit more about that, that refers to um, more or less specific types. So you can categorize subclasses. Uh, one of the relations we also use a lot in Go are, is a part of relation so that we can um, make associations between entities and their parts. And then in the ontology, each of these types have certain properties. So for example, um, every ontology term should have a unique identifier, a unique label, creation date, things like that. So the gene ontology um, was first published in 2000 uh, and was largely spearheaded by Michael Ashburner. And so the idea of the gene ontology is that we would be able to use um, a lot of the experimental data that has been generated from studies on model organisms. And when Go first started, it was primarily budding yeast and Drosophila and mice and C. elegans came along a bit later. But we would be able to use the biology um, and the experiments performed on model organisms, automatically transfer that, with hope, hopefully, to um, to knowledge on humans, as well as to a number of other uh, non model organisms for which uh, there might not be um, such an extensive uh, research communities. So what was pointed out in the paper is that, you know, the main opportunity with something like Go lies in the possibility of automated transfer of biological uh, annotations. And the hope was that this could be used to improve human health or agriculture. But at the same time, there was a real challenge, and that lies in meeting the requirements for a largely or entirely computational system uh, for transferring these annotations. So in Go, there are three main axes of classifications. So they are a molecular function, which refers to the activity or the job you might think of that a gene product uh, executes a cellular component, which is where that activity occurs, and then the biological process, which is a series of molecular functions that combine, like I said, to perform or accomplish a specific biological objective. So if we use an example, say the insulin signaling pathway, and we want to describe the insulin receptor kinase, so its molecular function is that it serves um, to bind insulin, and then also has a kinase activity. Its location, where that activity occurs, is a cellular plasma membrane. And then it's part of the larger biological process or objective of insulin signaling. So what actually constitutes a GO term? So if we take as a simple example uh, this GO term plasma membrane. So as I told you, every GO term has a unique um, identifier. It has a unique name. Um, it has a namespace to tell us which part of the ontology it's from. Um, where applicable, we will try to capture as many uh, relevant synonyms uh, as possible. And these actually, uh, in the ontology, are subdivided into things like exact synonyms, narrow synonyms, broad synonyms. Um, 
This particular term has an alternate ID, so sometimes in Go uh, we might decide that two terms that have been in the ontology actually re represent uh, similar things and we should merge them. The IDs will never actually go away, but you'll see an alternate ID on a term. And then uh, a free text definition uh, that ontology developers and curators uh, write to try to describe what we mean by this particular label. And then uh, each term uh, should have an associated reference. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here is that uh, this term is also part of subsets. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit later about how large that Go has gotten. It can be very useful for people trying to do um, just sort of summary views of biology to make use of slims or subsets. And so those are portions of the gene ontology that might be um, particularly relevant to a certain organism, yeast, prokaryotes, mouse, that people can then use um, to get an overview of a number of um, ent biological entities. So like I said, placement in the Go hierarchy, most of the relations that we use in Go are either is a or part of. And so this shows, again, the plasma membrane term and how those relations actually look in the Go. So from top to bottom, we're looking at uh, the least specific term down to uh, the most specific term in this example, plasma membrane. And so if you work your way up from plasma membrane up to cellular component and use this key for the relations, you can see how this term plasma membrane fits into the Go hierarchy. So what we say is a plasma membrane, it is a membrane, and in Go, a membrane is a cellular component. Um, plasma membrane in Go, we define as part of the cell periphery, which is a term that is really meant to capture um, the area uh, on the outer, uh, outer part of the cell. Um, that is, cell periphery is considered a cell part, and cell part is part of cell, and then on up to the, the broadest classification in Go, which is, uh, for this is cellular component. So this one is fairly straightforward, but as you can see, sometimes the Go hierarchy can get very deep and very complex. So this is the insulin signaling pathway term, and if you work your way up, you can see there are a lot of parental terms uh, for insulin signaling in Go, and there are even, in fact, some other relations that we use, uh, such as regulates, where we want to describe um, how one biological process or molecular function, say for example, um, is related to another uh, process, that it's not necessarily a part of that process, but it regulates, and that's a different relation in Go. But you can see that depending on where you are in the ontology, it can start to get increasingly complex. And we spend a lot of time in Go thinking about, um, you know, what are really useful and meaningful um, parent and grouping terms in ontology that people can use um, to help with their analysis. So just a few more things about relations in the ontology. So the is a relation, that's a transitive relation. So what that, that means is that if we say that in Go, um, A is a B and B is a C, then A is also a C. The nice thing about having these sort of different levels in the ontology is it actually allows us uh, to capture varying degrees of knowledge, which is an inherent part of research and science. So depending on what uh, has been demonstrated in a particular experiment, you might be able to just say that something was a transmembrane transporter, or in fact you might know it was a glucose transmembrane transporter, or maybe the authors were uh, specific and you know that you can annotate to D-glucose transmame transporter. But the useful thing is that you can still use these varying degrees of knowledge uh, to classify similar things. And as I mentioned before, the is a relation allows us um, to construct these sort of effective uh, slimming for summary views. And so this is taken from um, the website uh, that is, has just been released, the Alliance Genome, which is a collaborative effort amongst uh, the model organism databases and Go. And th so this is a view 
uh, a summary view of GO annotations for the glucose transporter. And so what you can see is that while we may have much more specific annotations in GO for that, we're able to use the ISA relationships uh, to sum up and give an overview of what this gene product does. So, um, like I said, there are a lot of other relations that we use in GO. Part of, in particular, is one that we use. Um, this describes um, relations between subcellular components. It describes relations between molecular functions and processes. Uh, it is also uh, transitive. Like I mentioned, we also use regulates, but we also um, qualify regulates. We use both the positively regulates and negatively regulates. Um, some other uh, relations that you might see in GO uh, occurs in. We'll sometimes make um, connections between biological process and cellular component. And then these two uh, that we use somewhat capable of and capable of part of, uh, those are relations that we sometimes use between um, protein complexes that are represented currently in the cellular component part of GO. And these are uh, relations between those cellular components uh, and go biological processes. Mm -hmm. um, no, 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 they're not, no. So like regulates, for example, that was just showing up right in process. Yep, right. Okay. So uh, from its inception, uh, in 2000, when the pap gene first gene ontology published, paper was published, uh, the gene ontology, as you can see, has grown a lot. So it started with about 2,000 biological process terms. We're now almost at 30,000. And likewise, for molecular function and for cellular component, there are many, many more terms in Go. So this becomes then uh, a ch real challenge for us, which is how do we develop and manage the ontology now that it has gotten uh, so big? So there are really two uh, elements of this. There's the human side of doing this, and then there's the tools and software uh, side. So Go is still um, manually constructed. Uh, we get a lot of our term suggestions from biocurators who work at the various model organism databases or other curation projects uh, who are reading papers and suggest to us that there are concepts uh, in the papers they're reading that aren't represented in Go and they would like um, for them to be added. Uh, we also uh, work a lot with domain experts in particular areas of biology. So we will have uh, specific topic meetings where we will sit down, say, and work with uh, people who, uh, for example, might be working on you know, cardiovascular development, and they would like um, to be able to use Go for their work. So we will work with them to develop the ontology. And then we have a, a small subset of people who are specifically dedicated to doing ontology development. Right now, all of us who do that started out as biocurators. Uh, and then we have a great team of software uh, developers uh, based in, in Berkeley who help uh, coordinate all of these efforts. So on the tools and software side, we use uh, the Protege tool uh, to, uh, to develop the gene ontology. It's available, available in both OBO and ALF file formats. One of the things I'll just touch on briefly is that in terms of managing the ontology, what we are trying to do is move towards having um, design patterns for a lot of these terms. So these are really stereotypical representations of different functions and processes in Go that we can reuse over and over. And that saves uh, a lot of time and effort um, you're not having to try to um, continually, uh, say, write new definitions for terms that are actually very similar to something that you already have. Uh, we use primarily the ELK reasoner, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we use that, our development. Everything gets managed uh, in GitHub. So all of our uh, ontology term requests, all of the updates to the ontology, um, the the Error checks, all of that happen as part of um, a GitHub repository. 
And then also in Go, we make use of a lot of other existing ontologies. So for example, the relations ontology uh, that houses uh, the relations that I talked about earlier. We also make use of things like the Uberon anatomy ontology. Uh, that way that when we are generating terms that might refer to an anatomical term, we can make use of an existing ontology to make sure that we actually place that term correctly and go. As well, we make use of the chemical ontology and database KEBI and uh, the protein ontology, as well as a number of others uh, that I haven't listed here. So this is a snapshot of what it looks like to be uh, editing, in the, editing the gene ontology and protege. So um, this is, uh, you can alternate back and forth uh, in protege between looking at an inferred view or an asserted view. So in the inferred view that I'm showing here, we're making use um, of all of the, the reasoning that happens with ELK to place terms in the correct uh, is a hierarchy in the go. And so all of the terms, like I said, have particular annotations associated with them, a label, an ID, a namespace, a definition, the references associated with the definition. And down here, are something that uh, we're trying to do. Many terms in Go currently have what we call um, an equivalence axiom or logical definition. And this enables us to make use of a lot of these other external ontologies to reason and make sure that we get Go terms placed correctly in the hierarchy. So for example, the logical definition for D-glucose transmembrane transporter activity is some transme transmembrane transporter activity and it transports or maintains the localization of some D-glucose, and that would be a KEBI term. And so what this means is that we can create this logical definition for our terms, and as long as what, um, and since we mirror KEBI, part of KEBI at least, in Go, when we create that term and run the reasoner, it will give us the, make sure that we have all the correct parentage in Go. So if we don't make things, use of things like this, if it can be uh, quite difficult to manage and make sure you're really getting all the correct parents in the ontology that you should. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, Go annotation. So the gene ontology is used to annotate genes and gene products. So what really constitutes a Go annotation? So this is the minimal set of information for a Go annotation. It needs to be an association between a unique database ident entity identifier for a gene or gene product. So in the case of the insulin signaling pathway that we looked at earlier, this might be, say, a Uniprot ID for the human insulin receptor. Uh, it has to be associated with a unique identifier for the GO term. And also, we keep very close track in GO of what is the evidence for the assertions that we make. What are the evidence? Um, for these annotations. So we make use of an evidence code. Um, Go currently um, in the file format, the GAF file format that we release, we use these three letter evidence codes, but most all of those translate to an entry into what is actually the evidence and conclusion ontology, which is known as ECO. And so that's a way of uh, keeping track, again, of the various uh, granularities you can actually have in evidence for an assertion. Um, and so all Go annotations must have an evidence code. We always record uh, the reference or the source of the information or the analysis that led to this association between a gene and a Go term. Most of the time, um, for manual annotations, that will be a, a PubMed reference. Uh, but there are other methodologies of Go annotation that may use other kinds of references. We always keep track of the date the annotation was made or uh, updated or changed, and then what uh, curation group actually made the annotation. In this case, one of our um, collaborators, our consortium members uh, at UCL. So uh, all of the Go annotations for all the model organism databases, as well as a number of other organisms, are available at the Gene Ontology site, both for browsing and for download. So this gives you a view of what's uh, in the Amigo browser. 
And so you can see the gene product, uh, its some common name or what it's named in the particular uh, contributing database, the GO annotations, contributor species, that evidence code, if it happens to be uh, part of a, a panther family, which is um, panther is a resource uh, for uh, classifying genes um, using phylogenetic methods, and then as well the reference and the date. And so this is really the sort of browsable view in Amigo, but if you're interested in um, accessing Go annotations uh, in parsable annotation file formats, you can go to the downloads page at Go. So how are Go annotations actually made? So there are a couple of different um, pipelines for annotation at Go, and what I'll talk about first are uh, sort of the manual literature-based annotation pipelines. So um, there are still a number of curators at the different groups who uh, their job is to read the literature, um, and then um, take the text of what is in published papers and manually associate the genes described in the experience of those papers with Go terms and uh, evidence. And so, as you can imagine, this requires a fair amount of domain expertise to read the papers, understand, interpret the experiments, and then have the knowledge of the gene ontology um, to make the appropriate uh, annotations. Uh, this is just a glimpse of one of the annotation tools that a number of people in our group actually use for doing this. This is a tool co called protein to go that was developed um, at the EBI in Hingston. And so it, um, this is a view of the annotations as, that have already been entered into the database. Uh, this is where curators would enter new annotations. And one of the nice things about the tool, um, in addition to some features like autocomplete, is that what we build into the tool are some annotation rules that we've developed over time and some real-time error checking. And so that speaks to uh, one of the issues that we feel is very important, which is having Go annotations from a number of different organisms um, follow a similar set of guidelines for their production. And so this helps um, keep the quality of Go annotation data high. So like I said, there are other uh, annotation pipelines for making Go annotations, and most of these are really based on uh, protein sequence similarities. So as you know, uh, there are many conserved domains or motifs and proteins of known function, and we can use these to predict the biological function of other maybe experimentally uncharacterized proteins, but that share those domains. And for some of the non-model organisms, uh, this makes up the bulk of the Go annotation that they have. So just as an example, a um, set of proteins, histones, are just some of the most highly conserved proteins in living organisms. Their role in packaging DNA within the cell is conserved. And so for newly sequenced genomes, if there are Go annotations that reflect the role of these highly conserved proteins, then we can automatically transfer those onto new organisms uh, to characterize uh, the sequences of uh, newly, uh, newly described organisms. So the manual annotation that we do, um, it produces a lot of high quality annotation. It's all supported by experimental evidence, but as you can imagine, uh, it is very labor intensive and it's expensive. So what we've been working on a lot at WormBase is are there aspects of the curation process that we could make more efficient. And so two of the things I'm going to talk about uh, with respect to this, uh, the first is some natural language processing and text mining applications that we make use of, and then also um, some new efforts that we've been working on at WormBase um, on micropublications. So this was taken um, from a paper that we published a few years ago, but this basically outlines uh, our workflow at WormBase. So this is color-coded so that the things that happen automatically are in blue. Uh, anything we do that's manual is in pink, and then we have things that we refer to as uh, semi-automated as well. 
So uh, every day we run an automated query on PubMed using the keyword elegance. And then we get uh, in a curation form uh, the abstracts and the authors and the journal for all of the papers that match that keyword search. And one curator goes through and manually reviews that and decides these papers are relevant for C. elegans or these are not. So that's our first uh, step in paper filtering. The next thing that happens is that we actually um, acquire the full text, usually as PDFs, of all of the papers that we bring in to Wormbase. And so on a yearly basis for us, that's probably somewhere around 1,500 um, PDFs. We also have uh, a pipeline of collaboration with the Genetic Society of America where papers uh, on C. elegans uh, that are being reviewed by genetics also come to Wormbase and we can work with them to um, mark up some of the entities in that text to link out uh, to Wormbase as well. So then a number of different things happen once we have the full text. So um, if it's PDF, it's converted to text and then we have um, an SVM, a support vector machine data type flagging pipeline that we use that I'll, I'll explain in a bit more detail. Uh, we have some pipelines that we use for entity recognition in those papers. In this case, we make use of a lot of the uh, dictionaries that we already have curated for C. elegans and we're based things like gene names um, or variation IDs. Um, we also um, use our uh, Textpresso information retrieval system that I'll talk about a bit more to do very highly directed searches for specific types of information. And we also work uh, with authors to try to uh, get them to help us flag different types of data uh, in their paper. And then lastly, we go through the process of fact extraction, which is still largely um, a fairly manual process for us. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we've used uh, support vector machines at Wormbase. So early on in Wormbase, we actually had one curator whose job it was uh, to review every seal against paper that came uh, through and flag it for the different data types. You know, this paper has, uh, describes a mutant phenotype, or this paper describes physical interactions. Um, but um, what we recognize is that this might be uh, an area of our pipeline where we could introduce some automation. So what we've done is um, using as training data our existing curation. So we could use that to get sets of po positive and negative papers. Uh, we trained a number of support vector machines uh, for 11 different data types. So like I said, for example, physical interactions, mutant phenotypes, uh, RNA interference experiments, enzymatic activities, anatomical expression patterns, things like that. And so using these positive and negative training sets, uh, we developed uh, SVMs that then allow us now for every new paper that comes into Wordbase, it's run through the SVM pipeline and what we get out based on um, the training is a list of um, papers and whether or not they've been predicted to be of high, medium, or low confidence for that particular data type, and then the list of negatives as well. And so this all makes use of uh, features, which are the words or the terminology that are found in these papers. And so as you can imagine, this works more or less well depending upon the data type. So for example, physical interactions or RNAi experiments, the language that people use to describe this is very characteristic. So something like an SVM works really well for those data types. Other things um, like anatomical expression, maybe not as well, though we're working to improve those. And if you want to know more about the details of how uh, we did this, um, it's described in this paper here. So this is something that every paper at Wormbase goes through when it first comes in. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about how we are trying to semi-automate the curation process. So depending on the kind of experiment, um, the results are often described in very stereotypical language in the scientific literature. 
And so what I've shown here is an example of three different sentences that are found in C. elegans papers where people are describing um, subcellular expression data. And so I've color-coded each of these sentences because they correspond to what we have um, put into different sort of categories for uh, the kind of terms that are in these sentences. So for example, these sentences always refer to a C. elegans uh, protein in capital letters here. Uh, C. elegans proteins or genes and proteins get named with three or four letters dash and a number. It's not very inventive. It's not nearly as inventive as Drosophila, but it works really well for text mining. Uh, so in this case, say HAM1, PUF8, uh, MY14MN2, those are all C. elegans uh, protein names. What's in green here are what we refer to as uh, assay terms. So these are the kinds of um, terms that people would use to describe uh, aspects of their experiment. So GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein, fluorescence, uh, diffuse is a common term that people might use to describe an expression pattern or overlapping. And then we also uh, made a category of terms we called just um, component verbs detected, distributed, enriched, appeared, things like that. And then lastly, a category for the cellular component terms as they are referred to in the literature. And so we use these categories as part of the uh, Texpresso information retrieval system to perform searches on the C. elegans full text. And then the output that we get are all of the sentences that matched um, our query, which is that they have to contain at least one of each of those category terms, and they have to also mention a C. elegans protein. So this kind of outlines uh, the Texpresso system. So again, we take the PDFs of the relevant literature, we take lists of things like the gene and protein names and synonyms. Uh, we've also collaborated um, with DigDBase and TEAR, so we have some plant cellular component terms as well. The PDF gets converted to text. Uh, the documents are marked up with uh, gene and protein names. The full text is also marked up with these category terms that we created. And then all of that is indexed and put in the Textpresso database. We perform these category searches and then the output is presented to curators uh, for their curation. And so the idea here is that uh, we want to semi-automate our curation. In other words, we want tools like Textpresso, text mining tools, to present curators with sentences from the papers and the curator can say yes or no, this uh, provides curatable data, and then put that into the database. Uh, so this, um, we're about uh, to launch a new Textpresso system. So our old system, we would just get back a list of sentences, right? And so one of the limitations of that when you just get back a list of sentences is that you're not really seeing those sentences in the context of the full paper. And so you might want to be looking at the figures that match that. You might want to look at a few sentences, you know, before or after that to confirm as a curator that you're making the right association. So to try to address some of those limitations of the original system, we developed a new system called Texpresso Central. It should be out later this year. And one of the features of that system is you can perform the same kind of category searches on the C. elegans literature, but you can also uh, customize the interface so that if a curator finds a paper that has sentences they think uh, would be suitable for curation, they can then open that um, that paper up in a paper viewer. It has the full text. The sentences are marked up in that. They can customize the kind of curation form that they want with any fields that they feel necessary. And then um, we work with them uh, to develop a data exchange protocol from our Texpresso database to their curation database. And so in theory, um, Anyone can do uh, their curation in this tool and send it out to whatever external database they use. So currently, uh, the literature in Texpress is the C. elegans literature, and then um, PMC open access. 
There is also a feature in the tool where um, anyone can upload their own paper set and that can be processed uh, through the, uh, the pipeline and people can do annotation on their own, um, on their own set of papers. And so um, we want to expand on this sort of fact extraction aspect of the pipeline to other data types, uh, namely physical interactions, enzymatic activities, see all again as disease models. And then we are also using other methods besides this uh, category approach uh, to classify sentences for fact extraction. So uh, one of our phenotype curators has worked um, with our Texpresso developers on using support vector machines on sentences, not just on whole documents. And we've done a little bit of work uh, on using hidden Markov models as well. But there are over 30 different data types that we curate at Wormbase, and so we're probably going to have to um, customize our approach to some extent for each of these. Uh, and then just along the lines of uh, text mining applications, I just wanted to mention something um, that we have, uh, the Texpresso team has uh, participated in in the past, but this has been a great interface uh, for getting uh, people who develop text mining tools and the biologists and curation communities together to try to develop applications uh, that are really useful for people in their curation work. So this is the BioCreative Initiative, which stands for Critical Assessment of Information Extraction in Biology. And it's a community-wide effort for evaluating text mining and information extraction systems. And so it aims to bring together biologists, biocurators, and text mining teams uh, to develop applications. And so they organize challenges roughly every two years for different kinds of NLP tasks. And anyone can participate if you have an idea for um, you know, an NLP approach for those tasks, you can register your team and they will um, they collect uh, gold standard training data uh, for you to, that people can make use of uh, and also supply test data uh, so people can test their tools as well. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, that's their website. They just recently had a meeting a few weeks ago. Um, so um, I also wanted to mention a new uh, initiative at Wernbase. And so it, what's clear is that a lot of time and effort and money goes into publishing data in papers and then a lot of time and effort and money goes into trying to get that data back out of papers. And so um, is this really the best model for communicating uh, scientific information? Is it the most efficient way to do that? So one of the things um, that has just recently gotten underway at Wormbase uh, is a new uh, journal called Micropublication Biology. And so the idea behind this journal is that it would be a vehicle for uh, scientists to support generally single experimental results. Um, the information is submitted to Wormbase in a database-friendly way, and so what that means is that we would like to enforce the use of controlled vocabularies and ontologies to, uh, to capture the data, that there are mandatory fields uh, that people might fill in. Uh, Micropublications are peer-reviewed, and they're assigned to DOI, so they're citable. And we can then directly incorporate this information into our biological curation database at Wormbase. And the curators and the scientists are then working with each other uh, prior to that information actually being published. So the interaction between uh, the people who generate the data and the people who curate the data happens earlier in that process. So um, submissions through micropublications micro are published online in this open access journal, which you can um, view here. And this has been the work at Caltech of Paul Sternberg and Daniela Ricciti, Tim Shadel, who is at WashU, and other Wormbase uh, team members, Karen Uke and Todd Harris. And so what we're hoping, right now what we have targeted are, um, is information in papers where people might 
um, refer to an observation they made, but say data not shown or data unpublished or unpublished observations. And we're initially trying to get that kind of data uh, into worm base, but the hope, of course, is that we can capture a lot more of uh, the experiments uh, that people are performing in the lab that either might not make it into uh, the larger story of a publication, um, and then the hope, of course, is, is to to improve on this and capture more of the information in this way so that um, we can really improve the efficiency at which we're getting information into, uh, into worm base. So the last thing I want to talk about is just to kind of come back to talking about biology as, um, as living systems and that really what the aim of curation is, is to help people understand those systems. So in the past, and as I uh, showed you earlier, gene ontology annotations were a relatively uh, straightforward associations between a database entity, a go term, evidence code, and a reference, right? But this is really the representation of biology that is more useful to the end users. This is the kind of thing that they are used to thinking about and looking at. But how do we go from this sort of uh, straightforward representation to something that is more like this? And so um, the answer to that and what the gene ontology is working on now is a new paradigm for annotation that we're referring to as GOCAM, which stands for Gene Ontology Causal Activity Models and a new uh, curation tool that the Berkeley group has developed as well. So the basic idea behind GoCam models is that we're going to use Go annotations and define semantics from the relations ontology to model more complex biological systems. The underlying data will be all stored as RDF owl, and as I said, the curation will be with this new annotation tool we have, Noctua. So this is what the curation uh, interface looks like in Noctua. So the idea is what we're trying to do is really to model right, activity flows, but using the gene ontology's vocabulary to do that. So the basic unit of annotation here we refer to as an anaton, and so it captures all elements of the go, and it, really the basis for that is the molecular function. So if we look at insulin signaling, for example, again, what we say is that um, there's an activity for insulin that's a receptor ligand activity. What this model captures is what ena who enables that activity. And this, uh, with this relation enabled by, and this model is modeling human insulin signaling. And so you see the, uh, the textual name for insulin there, but this is tied uh, to a unique database identifier. Where does that activity occur? It occurs in the extracellular space. So what is the effect of that activity? Well, the receptor ligand activity that's enabled by insulin has the effect of directly positively regulating the activity, the insulin activated receptor activity that's enabled by the insulin receptor. And so this is a relation from the relations ontology. The directly part uh, refers to the fact that we know these things are physically interact with one another and the positively regulates describes the outcome of that physical interaction, that we know it has a positive or activating effect on the receptor activity. And then for each of these molecular functions, we make it clear um, what that function, what larger biological process that function is part of, in this case, insulin receptor signaling pathway. And so one of the nice things about modeling this way is that um, we are modeling, uh, we are trying to model instances here. So if we go back to describing what the ontology itself does, it models classes of things. So we can't put relations in the ontology, say for example, and is a relation, unless it holds for all the members of that class. But the nice thing here in Noctua is that we, we are actually trying to do is um, model instances. And so we can create models of things that might hold true in this particular pathway in a certain organism and under certain conditions that might not necessarily hold uh, for the ontology. And so this is a very simple uh, representation of um, how two different activities affect one another, but 
is there just two players in the insulin signaling pathway? As you start to um, go out and model the entire pathway, you get to something that looks like this in the annotation tool. So all of the relations are there. Evidence uh, is put on each of the statements that we make in this model. But we recognize that most users aren't going to want to look at a model that looks like this. It would be hard to make sense of. So one of the biggest challenges we have in Go right now are taking uh, these representations that we have in our graphical tool interface and trying to find uh, intelligent ways uh, to convert that into something that um, makes a lot more sense to biologists, but all the while preserving uh, the underlying semantics and the evidence so that um, it's clear to people why and how we made the statements that we made in those models. So this is the direction that uh, the gene ontology is heading in uh, in the future. Okay, so um, lastly, this is um, clearly a very collaborative uh, effort. And so I really want to acknowledge a number of the people who've been involved. So like I said earlier, Michael Ashburner was instrumental uh, in developing the gene ontology. Uh, he's currently retired. But uh, the other PIs on the Gene Ontology Consortium grant right now are Judy Blake at MGI, Mike Cherry at Stanford, Susie Lewis uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, Paul Sternberg at Caltech, and Paul Thomas at USC. Um, a number of my other colleagues, um, Pascal Gaudet at the SIB in Geneva, David, MGI, YU at USC, and particularly Chris Mungle uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, have contributed um, tremendously uh, to the development of the ontology to annotation practices. Uh, Seth Carbon is a developer at uh, Lawrence Berkeley who's developed the Noctua um, annotation tool as well as a lot of the features of the Amigo um, web browser. And then there are a number of Go curators from uh, different model organism databases and as well as Uniprot and Swissprot. Uh, who are really instrumental in keeping the gene ontology annotations and ontology itself up to date. Um, and at WormBase, uh, Paul Kersey, Lincoln Stein, and Paul Sternberg are PIs on that project. And then a number of, uh, we have a number of curators and developers. We are spread out over Caltech, the EBI in Hingston, NOICR in Toronto. And then lastly, for their work on Texpresso, Hans Michael Muller, Valerio Arnibaldi, and uh, formerly uh, Yuling Lee. Okay, so thank you all very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Well, how far along is your micro-publication project? Yeah. Like, how, is that, how is that working? So um, that grant just got funded in early summer. Um, so, um, I would say um, each month we're probably getting uh, five to ten submissions. Um, so, we'll see, you know, as how it catches on. Um, but, yeah, they just got formally funded uh, for this in June. And I should also mention they're working with the uh, Collaborative Knowledge Foundation um, to try to do this, not just for C. elegans, but for other organisms as well. Yeah. Um, so we actually reached out to the C. elegans community to ask people, you know, would you be willing to serve uh, as reviewers? Um, we're also thinking about using uh, Texpresso to help us identify who would be good reviewers who's done similar work. Um, and so really we just, we just asked people. You know. For those 29 million PubMed papers, if the number's going to go up, we have little tiny papers. We'll have little tiny papers, right, right, but um, they will be, right, 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 yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I didn't touch on that that much, but one of the reasons that, say, our semi-automated fact extraction actually works is because uh, even though our sentence recall might be low, um, our recall at actually getting the right annotation is reasonable, it's good enough, and it's for exactly that reason. People repeat themselves in papers. And if you look at scientific papers, and think, all right, these are the sentences that actually describe the new experimental result, and that's what we want to put in the databases. 
you know, it sometimes is a small subset of what's actually in the paper. Yeah, yeah. Can a, <clears throat> can a micro publication go from micro publication to database without a curator touch? Um, I think not yet. I think not yet. So that's what I was saying. We still have the dialogue now going between the curators and the submitters. So I don't think we've gotten to that yet. It would be fantastic, right, if at some point we could do that. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> it would still be peer reviewed, right, but maybe uh, the information that went in, right, wouldn't necessarily have to have a curator do QC or things like that, right. So the pathway challenge, yeah. it sounds like the, it's a challenge, right? Yes, it is. And then mm -hmm. you, said, you added on to that some granularity where, oh, maybe in this organism, it's specific in this cell. Right, so right, exactly. I mean, just the challenge to capture the data to build the pathway that's usable by a biologist. Right. Probably. Yes. And then layer on top of that, it may be different in different cells. Absolutely. Right. So I mean, right. it's mind boggling that we're now getting down to the cellular level within the right. organism. Right. Right. And different organisms. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. So that's ultimately because what, my yeah. Is what, I mean, this, it seems like an enormous. It is. It is a big market. task. So I think. One of the things we really want to try to do is make use of, you know, the past 15 years worth of Go annotation that we already have, right? So we're not just starting all over again, right? There are a lot of annotations in the database that we can use to seed these models. And so then the job of the curator really becomes more of like QC, you know, are the relations between things correct, right? We also have, you know, other kinds of data in word base. So if I want to say, uh, make a model for a signaling pathway that happens at one particular stage of development and it affects development of these particular cells. I can make use of expre gene expression data, say, that we have in Wormbase to fill in that information of where and when this happens. So the idea, right, is we're really trying to integrate a lot more different data types that we have. There are a lot of physical interaction databases out there, BioGrid, uh, Intact, you know, can we make use of the data that they have to inform those relations for those direct interactions? So ultimately, we'd really like to try to pull in as much different um, supporting data that we can and use what we already have. Including single cell RNA sequencing, which is just right. kind of like your eyes roll. <laughs> <laughs> because like that yeah. where they can actually sequence the RNA from single cells mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then describe it and put it back together. Right, right. Right. It's like right. the enormity of that is just like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. coming yeah. down. I guess we don't really know how to deal with that yet, right? We're, we we're learning. Yeah, we're, we're learning. learning. Yeah. <laughs> right. right, right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. So Bill has been since converted completely in an owl, an owl light? No. Owl no, no, no. So the ontology is the annotations have not. And so traditionally, right, the, the main use for Go has been with gene set enrichment analysis, right? And the input for that are these gene association files. That's not going to change, I think, for quite some time. We really need to get a lot more models in to make that useful for that kind of analysis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yes, yeah, yeah. So the Bell Group has actually um, participated uh, in some of the biocreative challenges. So that's where um, I have learned about that, right? And the kinds of things that they're trying to do are similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, thanks very much.